Oh, if I were a blackbird, I'd whistle and sing. I'd fly to the ship that my laddie sails in. And on his tall mast I would build me a nest. For to gaze on my true love, the lad I love best. She plotted her hair all in three plants. She plotted them both together. She tied them round, oh, young William's neck. She says, my love, we'll go together. And the other piece? You can't both at Tuffy and Thartney. Yeah, what's that? That's one of the Lancashire proverbs. Yeah. Have you switched it on? Yeah. That means you can't have your toffee on your money. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You look under it leaves, footnotes. Mm. That means your riches are not on top. Mm. There's not but three generations between clubs and clubs. Yeah. That means yeah. no difference. Yeah. We live and learn, and then they do, and they forget it all. And I'd as leaf be killed as frequent to dear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Found some more. There's some more over here. That's what I find. Would you like me to read you one of these characters? Yes, please. Well, I'll read it. I'll read you out. Uh, Bill Watts, it does it. It gets a good laugh. You've not it switched on yet, have uh, you? Yeah, no, yeah. Just a minute. Mother asks questions. Yeah, what's it? Dan's mother asks questions. Yeah. After John Bickett had had his stay at Sarah's, that mem memorable Sunday afternoon, which no doubt you've already heard about, and after he'd parted from her aunt doorstep, it were well at ten o'clock at night. He set off for one, of course, feeling as happy as a throstle singing on a twig. It were a bonny starry night, and though Dan were no poet, nor out at mither in May, he thought stars decorated sky very nicely. They were such pretty things to have about you when you were courting. Courting, by go. What a sweet thing it were. He felt somewhat like a flea, what's dropped into treacle pot. Aye, and it kissed Sarah, I know. Well, over his sweetheart, on some day they get wed. That were chief thing. Sarah were his and he were hers. And life was as good as garden of Eden, or a Sunday school field day, where you get a sup at fast brew at coffee. This was what Dan were thinking as he walked on. When he opened the door rather sheepishly and went in, Dan found his mother sitting up, waiting for him. His father and younger brother and sister must have gone to bed. Dan's mother glanced up at Clark Count Warren, who says, Where's to been till this time? Oh, it's none so late, said Dan, pulling his hat off and putting it on dresser. That clock's a bit fast, I think. That clock's right, said his mother, and it keeps good hours. How is it there's not been one to the tea today? Poor Dan, he blushed. But what could he say? Where has to been now? Now we are as said the tea, said his mother again. Well, some women never bother whether their lads come one for the tea or not. But Dan's mother were one at the inquisitive kind and who liked knowing everything. Tail and tail's master. And I wed her suspicions as Dan had started courting. Dan said no, but he bent down and began unlacing his shoe. He felt terrible uncomfortable. He hadn't thought his courting were going to raise any stir like this. He thought he'd gone through enough at Sarah's with her mother. Now don't be it in the cell of the shoon, said his mother. As to had the tea. Aye, said Dan. Where, said his mother. Dan took the dispoot lace. In a house. I know that, thou goblin, said Mrs. Bickett. I don't suppose that ever did pig coat. Who was ours? Dan scratched his head. Um, in Ribble Street. On who to stand now in Ribble Street? What were you doing there? Uh, well, you see, Mother, I were having a walk round and they were on tea time 
and folk were just having their tea, so um, they, they just asked me. Oh, eh, what folk? said Mrs. Bickett, getting out of patience. Well, folk, what I had me tea with, said Dan. <clears throat> His mother sprung up out of her chair. Now let's say no more of this, and don't be trying to hack a num. I can't for shame make a fool of thee, mother. It's my belief thou letting somebody make a fool of thee. There's a wench at bottom of this, or I'm sadly missed ten. Now who is who? Well, let's be no it fuzzy's name. Who's nosy, said Dan. Who's a waver? Oh, so I was right. I'm never so far out of me thoughts. So there is a wench in it. Well, who is who? Er what lives at where I'd me tea, said Dan. Oh, let's end on of the half talk, or I'll hit them yet with them brush. Big as they are, they fancies they sell now as that's getting a girl, doesn't they? Dan's mother evidently didn't relish the idea of a rowdy's lad starting courting. Now let me tell thee this, little mum. Thou might think because thou's just aren't nineteen, was thou to mum. Thou but a child yet, and there's plenty of time for thee to think about courting. I suppose thou thinks as thou's ought sense it world, and as thou old enough to consider about courting and wedding on ten shilling a week. Why, thou doesn't keep this early mate, let alone clues and other luxuries. But I suppose thou thinking thou'll be out of the time to hear, and thou'll get a journeyman's wage, and then thou'll leave the mother, and thou'll take it to somebody else as soon as thou come. When they're earning a bit more. Oh, I I understand. I'm an ever up trouble of bringing the up and keeping there. And then, as soon as the wage will do me a bit of good, off thou goes to wed some giddy wench and let her squander it. It's all us way. I don't see it's any use having children these days and bringing them up. It's not worthwhile. If thou thinks that can mend the shop, thou better be going. And if thou thinks any wench shall do better for thee than thy mother, well, I can pack the clothes and get to her at once, and let her ever try. I'm not being put none, and I weren't slighted. I'll tell her that. Well, Dan didn't know what to say. He never dreamt such scenes as this would be through a courting programme. His mother ripped on like a mad woman, and then went out quietened down, who really was a good-hearted woman, but who must ever tongues wife out of everything, even if it were her son's courting. And then every mother always as more or less jealous at last, what lure slab away from her. It's female human nature. Well, when who'd wound her reel, Dan's mother went to Thune, who poured a jug of coffee out and poured a cup for lap for him and who set it on the table, along with a beef butty. And who says, now come and get the supper and let's be getting to bed. It's gone eleven. Dan smiled to his cell as he tattled his supper. His mother's words were not but talk, but her deeds were gradely. I'll warrant thou said no better than that where thou's been, said his mother. Dan smiled. No mother of knob, and this is good. Eh, there's nobody can lick your making coffee. Mrs. Bickett preened. But who put on what who thought were necessary gruffness, and who says, Be off with her, or thou never going to be up for the work it morning. As Dan walked upstairs, he said to his cell, I wonder how my father went on when he were courting my mother. On two or three minutes later, Dan's mother, kneeling in bed, where Dan's father were snoring as if his nose had getting full steam up, were whispering, if her son could have just heard, Oh, Heavenly Father, if my lad must start courting, and I suppose he can't help but follow up without fashion, See as he gets a good wench, one as will be clean and true, and look after him weel, and cook his meals greatly, keep his stockings in good order, and attend to her one, instead of gallivanting about with K on her finger. And if my lad really must have a lass, see as he gets a good un. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
My married life was one long laugh because my husband was very humorous in a dry sort of a way. When I was made the chairman of the British Legion Women's Section, the first one in the district, I had uh, a note to say that a gentleman and a lady would be coming to call on me to talk about Legion business. So I said to my husband, and we spoke very broad to each other, Now lad, I'm having company tomorrow, so think on we talk fine. I said, yeah. he looked at me and he says, Oh, heck, that's going to be some queer doings. I said, well, we'll talk fine if that doesn't mind. So I had a good do at baking, and it had turned out quite successful. Our visitors arrived, and my husband behaved perfectly and spoke perfectly. Just as we'd set the table all for tea and sat down, I was just going to pour out, and the custard pie had the place of honour in the middle of the table, when a knock came to the front door. He nipped up, and he catches all of the pie. He says, "Eh, hey, that'll be Bertha who want her pie back. I forgot to be a lady, and I says, you clown, where to go in with pie? I couldn't let tell you what the faces were like of this gentleman and lady. They must have thought we were something the cat had brought in. My husband come back without the pie, and I says, you clown, what's to done with pie? Oh, he says, I'm sorry, but he says, you see, um, my neighbour... They'd lent my wife this custard pie to swank with because we had some fancy folk coming, yo. And he said, who'd made up her mind we were going to talk fine, you see. Well, who's had visitors and who wants her pie back? I was livid, but I couldn't show it, being too much of a lady as I thought. And then all at once I said, what has to done with pie? And he says, oh, it's a it parlour. When I went in the parlour, he put it on the floor and my little healer dog were just finishing the middle off. It was quite a long laugh, but it taught me one lesson. Be what there if evening royalty comes, and I always have been since. Well, you can only be yourself, can't you? Wait a minute. Oh. Yeah. This is an old song, but it changes key, as you'll notice, at the second half. Now I'd like to sing to you About my love so true He was chief engineer on the White Star Line One with the backyard view His beauty was all he had He'd a mouth just like a cram He'd an injurable lip like the rudder of a ship And I tell you he's gone man I shall never forget the day his spirit passed away It was early About ten o'clock at night When the birds were sweetly singing And the ducks were making hay And the sun and moon were shining Both at night We stuffed his mouth with glue To try to bring him to But found all our efforts were in vain for he just stood up and smiled And then dropped down and died And he blowed his nose and he smiled and died again So he's gone forevermore At the age of ninety-four I'll never see my cross-eyed boy again I'm going to the graveyard To fulfil his last request and plant a blood red rose upon his grave. <laughs> That's good. After the ball was over, Susie took out her glass eye, put her false teeth in a basin, corked up her bottle of dye. Put her cock leg in the corner, hung up her wig on the wall, and all that was left went to bye bye after the ball.